Well, thank you for joining us. My name again is Lad Keith, and I'm an assistant professor in planning and sustainable built environments and chair of the sustainable built environments program at the University of Arizona. And this presentation is on innovations in heat planning research and practice, and will provide a good foundation for the next two presentations in the series of master classes. So there are quite a few impacts from extreme heat that we think about related to urban planning. Obviously, public health is a major concern. And on the more drastic side, uh, extreme heat can result in quite a few deaths. And so dramatic events like the European 2003 heat wave resulted in 70,000 deaths. And the more recent 2010 Russian heat wave resulted in 55,000 deaths. But beyond those acute events, we also want to think about chronic issues, um, particularly faced by marginalized or lower income populations and people across the world that may have to deal with extreme temperatures on a regular basis. Um, and those may not result in deaths, but do result in hospitalizations or um, people dealing with those medical issues at home um, and may exacerbate existing health issues. We also think about quality of life and so how livable are cities with increasing temperatures and do people have to shift their activities early or later in the day or not do them at all? So maybe it's not safe enough to let your children go outside and play at a park if it's too hot outside. There's also economic impacts from extreme heat. One study found that economic um, activity was depressed during heat waves. And more staggering, a study found that in 2017, uh, globally, we lost 150 billion labor hours um, from extreme heat that year, a number expected to increase as temperatures increase. Energy and water use is a big nexus with the heat, and both of those tend to increase during heat waves as people need to use more air conditioning and there's more strain on the electrical system and also as more water is used to water landscapes or uh, potentially agriculture um, as those temperatures increase as well. Another impact is to infrastructure and urban systems. And so are those designed appropriately for increasing temperatures? Uh, so you can think uh, one example would be maybe airport runways and planes um, where they can't take off if temperatures exceed a certain threshold. And that happens occasionally to the city north of myself in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but also less exciting would be um, the other infrastructure systems that we put massive amounts of money into, like transportation corridors or transit systems. And are those really designed appropriately for pedestrians and transit users uh, during uh, heat waves and also just normally hot days? Ecology and landscapes also have impacts from urban heat. And so studies have shown that um, urban ecology is impacted and less diverse um, in, in increasing temperatures and also during heat waves has uh, quite a bit of uh, vitality lost and uh, can be threatened. Um, and as well as landscapes require more maintenance during heat waves and especially the cost increase if that landscape needs to be um, replaced entirely. And then finally, sustainable development efforts that cities have been making um, to do things like reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so cities have been pursuing um, more mixed uses increasing density and increasing walkability and mass transit use, things like bicycling and all of those things are counteracted by increasing temperatures that may uh, continue to encourage people to stay indoors or stay in air conditioned spaces or to use air conditioned uh, mass transportation options or their uh, personal automobile um, rather than walking or bicycling. And so thinking of extreme heat beyond uh, just uh, the current efforts, but also how it impacts some of the things that we're planning for as well. So two contributors to extreme heat, one is climate change. And obviously that's the increase in global average temperatures due to human caused greenhouse gas emissions. And that results in increased duration, frequency and extremes of heat waves. And unfortunately also we're seeing faster increase in nighttime temperatures, um, which has a big impact on public health and human health as we need those um, cooler nighttime temperatures to um, recover and refresh our bodies. And as you can see in the schematic to the right, a small increase in average temperatures can actually lead to much more hot weather and much more extreme hot weather on the tail end of that graph. Another thing to consider is uh, this map that shows, uh, probably pretty familiar, just shows the temperature rankings from May 2020 and just shows the amount of record warm for just last month alone, but we continue to see records like this get broken. And this has uh, big impacts for um, global populations. And so you can just see the numbers to the left that 128 million people were under excessive heat wave warnings last summer in the United States. 
321 million people in Europe last summer were affected by the heat wave. And those numbers are dwarfed by the 890 million people in India affected by their um, heat wave last year too. So this is a climate risk with um, global implications. Another contributor to extreme heat is the urban heat island effect. And you can see in the schematics to the right um, showing daytime and nighttime temperatures. And it's just the idea that the way that we build and operate our built environment, um, the way that we plan and design it, uh, results in a built environment that is hotter than the surrounding natural uh, countryside. And so that results from things like land use and cover change, urban forms of so the way that our buildings are arranged, the height and the density of them, and then the building materials and reflectivity. So if it absorbs a lot of that heat uh, or if it reflects it back. Uh, the amount of vegetation and humidity plays a role, as well as waste heat emissions from things like air conditioning or um, automobiles, as well as the air pollution in general that um, can also trap the heat in city areas. And so one thing to keep in mind is that uh, urban heat islands are very specific to their locations, and so they're influenced a lot by geography and climate too. So you might see a more traditional urban heat island with the center being much hotter than the surrounding countryside if you're in a temperate area that has forests around it, whereas the, if you're in a desert area, um, you may see actually some areas in the cooler in the city that are cooler than the surrounding countryside just because they're irrigated and uh, much more vegetated than maybe the surrounding desert. And another thing to keep in mind is that the urban heat island effect is useful but um, does not necessarily accurately represent what people feel as they walk through these areas. And so um, there is a correlation with thermal comfort, but it's not necessarily direct. So on to the planning for extreme heat paper that uh, myself, Sarah Miro, and Tess Wagner have been working on. This paper is currently under review. Um, but what got us started with this is that quite a few planners in the United States are concerned about extreme heat. So an American Planning Association study showed that 70% of planners are worried about it. And heat actually ranks fourth out of 14 hazards for concern. Um, but that's a big disconnect because an assessment of 3,500 online climate adaptation resources found that only 4% of those actually focused on heat. So we conducted a systematic literature review of the current state of heat research planning, and we looked for papers that had extreme heat, urban heat, and planning uh, in the title, abstract, or keyword. And so you can see here that uh, from the results from that search, that 60% of those papers have been written in the last year. So there's quite a bit of research has been done very recently on, on extreme heat and planning. And also to note um, the geography of this heat planning research. So not surprisingly, China and the United States produce a large number of the world's um, peer reviewed papers. Um, and there's also quite a few papers from extreme heat from those two countries. Uh, but also to note, Australia has a relatively low um, population compared, but also has quite a few papers. And so that's obviously an issue of concern in that country. Um, another thing to note is who is not on this list or well represented by this list. And I would say the global South as a whole. And so continents like Africa, continents like South America and specific countries like India um, aren't necessarily very well represented on here, which could have implications for planning research and practice for heat as well. And then finally, we were looking specifically for those papers that were um, about planning processes or heat governance. Um, but we found that 68% of the papers in that um, search were actually on urban heat island mapping and modeling. So 68% um, were focused on modeling. 14% were focused on the design of the built environment. 7% were the ones that we were really looking for, which was how you plan for heat. And then 5% were on heat impacts, and then 4% were on literature reviews, 3% were on other. So the message here is that quite a lot of that research done in the last five years has been on modeling or mapping the urban heat island effect. So from that research that we did, we found, uh, came up with some themes from across those papers. And again, this is coming from about 7% of papers focused specifically on planning processes for heat. And so one was breaking down heat planning silos. So Across the papers, they talked about how public health is dealt with in one area, how urban planning is dealing with heat in another area, and how the information provided to both of those is separate as well. So an important thing would be to break down those heat planning silos. Another one was mainstreaming and the need to integrate extreme heat strategies into existing plans 
Those could be plans like long range plans of the community or climate action plans or hazard mitigation plans. And also discussed was the appropriate planning scale versus the tools available. And so there's a lot of discussion again about those urban heat island maps, but then uh, what was actually um, available to the government to do, whether it was design interventions or kind of the regulation tools that they had available to them. And those information sources didn't necessarily match the tools that they had. Also discussed was the lack of legal structures for heat planning. And this was interesting because that's something personally I've noticed working on heat in the United States with urban planners and other practitioners. Um, and that was something that was pretty common across the whole world actually that compared to other risks like flooding or wildfire or hurricanes, or you can imagine all the other climate risks that are um, considered, there's just a real lack of legal structures for heat planning currently. And then a uh, final uh, theme under institutional challenges and opportunities was acknowledging the complexities of urban heat, um, competing priorities where it might not be the top risk that people are thinking of because it's less visible than other more pressing issues and in general limited resources that governments have to deal with it. Another theme area was information uses and needs, and this includes urban heat island mapping and modeling. Um, so again, those were, those were common information sources, and we saw that in the research being developed too. Um, but we also saw that the use of climate change projections was very limited. So that might lead cities to plan for what they're currently at for their climate state or what they've experienced in the past versus um, the climate that they're projected to be in in the future. And so there's a disconnect there between that. We also found a lack of information connecting health risks and vulnerabilities to the planning strategies actually being implemented. And uh, another one was a need to quantify costs and benefits of heat mitigation. So really understanding what benefits were being derived from the interventions that were being undertaken. And in general, decision, maker, uh, decision makers lacked training for urban heat planning. And uh, finally, heat research being produced was not always useful for decision making. And again, a lot of that was um, relating back to the focus on heat island um, mapping and modeling. And a lot of that produces very interesting information. But then when you go to actually implement or govern based off of it, there's not a lot of um, connection to the tools available or processes that decision makers need um, to move forward with. So we found two main strategies for planning for heat. One of those would be the risk management strategy, so how you prepare for or respond to extreme heat events. And there was quite a tension between managing it as an emergency issue versus a chronic social issue. Um, so there was that acute and chronic kind of uh, issue that I mentioned earlier. And then also a need to understand and address the root causes of vulnerability um, versus just looking at heat um, by itself in a silo. And then the other large category was design of the built environment. And uh, one thing to note here is that many of the design strategies we looked at were very location specific and so not very universally applicable, which is a challenge. And you can see just to the image, um, you know, if you're looking at kind of hospitalizations from an extreme heat event, we usually look at that as a separate thing from the design of the built environment where that person may have been impacted by the heat wave. And so we don't do a good job of connecting those two categories of heat planning strategies currently. So on the planning and design strategy side, um, one major area was urban development patterns. That includes urban geometry and density as shown in this image by Jeffrey Raven. Uh, ventilation corridors, especially for places that were higher density like New York City or Hong Kong. Location and size of parks and open space as a heat mitigation tool and water features, both natural and uh, potentially man-made like water fountains or splash pads. And the land conservation was something that was found um, to be important too as well. So kind of conserving the natural areas around the city for their heat mitigation purposes. Another category was building design and materials for planning and design strategies. And that included the orientation of the building, the shape and massing of the building, and then shade structures used within it. And the example I have here is from the ENR2 building at my own University of Arizona campus. And you can see that this building is um, an example of biomimicry where it actually mimics uh, the natural slot canyons found in the United States desert Southwest and provides shade for many outdoor seating areas. So that, that limits the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from air conditioning and still lets people sit outside in relatively cool spaces 
um, compared with other buildings that might not have these features. And you can see the bottom of the building is um, well vegetated too. And uh, it also recycles water and kind of has a nice evapotranspiration to increase the cooling um, potential of the building outside as well. Another category was light and reflective surfaces, and that included uh, cool roofs, reflective, cool and reflective roofs, walls, and pavements. And the example here is from Cool Neighborhoods New York City, um, which is a jobs placement program and training program um, where they uh, go and retrofit these buildings and um, paint reflective uh, surfaces on the top of the roofs to ensure that these buildings um, reflect more of that heat back and that the air conditioning requirements of the buildings is lowered. Another category was waste heat reduction with smart building sensors and thermostat controls and more efficient HVAC systems and lighting. And then importantly, um, waste, uh, waste heat will be created by buildings. And so making sure that even if it's reduced that you vent that waste heat away from pedestrians in appropriate locations. And finally, a large category was urban greening. And so that includes things like increasing tree canopy and more specifically increasing that tree canopy and very uh, pedestrian friendly and places where it's actually going to be used by people for shade. Green infrastructure that captures water that uh, naturally flows to reduce urban flooding and then also um, increases vegetation from it and reduces the demands on uh, natural water areas. And then also green roofs and walls, which is an interesting example because that's one of those that's very regional specific. And so some temperate or humid locations, it's very appropriate to do that. But in more desert or arid locations like where I'm at in Tucson, Arizona, um, those are very hard to sustain just because of the plant species. Um, and so that's a very specific one regionally as well. And then the idea generally of future-proofing the landscaping. And again, many of the plants that we use are based off of historical cultural reasons. Uh, they might be based off of the past environment that um, we've experienced in cities for a while versus looking at the future projections and what plants will actually thrive in the climate that these cities are moving into in the future. And so the idea that um, we should be choosing plants that actually have the ability to thrive in these changing conditions. So some future considerations for research and practice. One is to very carefully consider co-benefits, trade-offs, and maladaptation. And again, the idea here is that none of these solutions are a silver bullet. So some solutions may have more benefits stacked on top of each other, like green infrastructure that can reduce urban flooding while mitigating heat. Some may have trade-offs like that. Uh, the idea that for um, social equity, maybe you have an air conditioning assistance program um, to ensure that the lower income populations or marginalized populations um, have access to uh, equitable uh, thermal comfort in their indoor spaces, but that also can increase greenhouse gas emissions. So you may have to put a little bit more money in to retrofit those buildings, but that's a trade-off that you decide to do. And then maladaptations, an example of that could be um, painting streets with reflective paint, which um, some cities have experimented with and um, recent research has shown in some specific locations that that can reflect the heat back onto pedestrians on the sidewalk or nearby buildings, um, kind of increasing discomfort with pedestrians and increasing energy use. So that might be a solution that you decide not to do. More exploration is needed for heat planning processes and heat governance, and also research and information being produced is not always helpful, like I mentioned. Um, so there's existing methods like co-production of climate knowledge, where you actually involve those end users of the information in the research process to make sure that it's usable and salient. And so some questions we had, what are the most appropriate scales for extreme heat planning? What institutional structures really facilitate that collaboration? And what's the right balance between strategies that manage or reduce extreme heat? Some resources. Uh, so some of the examples that I mentioned are from the Urban Land Institute Scorched Report that you can find for free at uli.org slash extreme heat. So I was a science reviewer and contributor to that report and it's very practically written. So it's great for practitioners. Um, and there's also several of these case studies at developingresilience.uli.org. And then finally, the paper that um, myself, Sarah Miro, and Tess Wagner um, have currently under review. And thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. You can email me if you have any other questions at lad, L-A-D-D, at arizona.edu, or my Twitter account, Lad Keith. Thank you very much.